See, I'm getting... Oh. Okay, um, welcome everybody. Oh gosh, that seems very loud today. Um, thank you all for attending the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, once again. Uh, welcome to our listeners um, online there. I don't know if anyone can see us, but um, I'm sure they can listen and hear us. If you can please remember every time that you speak to put your microphone on, because otherwise um, the people on, on there can't hear us. So um, without further ado, um, we're not expecting an emergency, so if we do hear anything, just follow John out that door, because um, I don't think we'll fit out them windows because we can't open them that well. Okay, so uh, moving on to item one on the agenda, which is to confirm as a true record the minutes of the meeting. Is there anyone, uh, Councillor uh, Jeff Brody? Sorry, yes, I think there's an error in the minutes in terms of my question about poverty and deprivation. It refers to Pan and Ride East. I think you should say Ride Northeast. Ride East is a relatively affluent area of Ride, nor does Apley and Elmfield. Thank you. Very important. Thank you very much. Are there any other one? Is Has anyone else got any comment? Could somebody approve that that's a true record, please? And second, thank you, Norman. And Debbie seconded. Thank you. I'll just sign these. Okay, moving on. Are there any declarations of interest today, please? No, no declarations of interest. Thank you very much. So we move on to item three on the agenda, which is public question time. Um, Mr. Jeff Brody. Thank you, Chair. At the last Health and Wellbeing Board, I expressed my continuing frustration with the failure of successive Health and Wellbeing Board strategies to help reduce poverty and inequality within my ward of Pan and Barton, most deprived of them all. I was asked to submit a list of suggestions. I did this promptly on the 1st of August. As of today, I have had no substantive response from either you or your cabinet colleagues on the Health and Wellbeing Board. How can my residents have any faith in these strategies when they know, and I know, it is just words in another dusty document. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brody. We have got them here. We have got your list of things, and it is they are being actioned. They are being actioned. But as you know, and as I said to you on at, at scrutiny, and uh, not at scrutiny at uh, cabinet. The, the wheels will move very slowly um, and sometimes almost to the point of not moving. But we've, we will move forward on these. These are really good suggestions, but not only for your ward, but the other deprived wards in, in, on the island. So again, I thank you very much for making these. I will ensure the chief exec makes sure that these items are sent on to the relevant people that can actually action these points. Okay? If I could just come back, Chair, yeah, that's, that's all well and good. But my residents and I have been waiting for this for nearly 17 years now, and my predecessor as Isla White Councillor was also waiting for it. We constantly talk about it. We constantly raise it at meetings. We do a lot of great stuff within my community through the Community Association, but we feel that we get no help from the Isle of Wight Council. And I'm not going to let you off the hook on this administration or this board. This board has got to start doing things instead of just being a talking shop. Thank you. And we will be. So, moving on. Um, are there any other questions from members of the public? No? Okay, so quick chairman's update. Item four, um, the issues raised by Councillor Brody at the last meeting um, in relation to health inequalities are now being picked up by the council and feature in its new corporate plan. 
Um, the Council's new corporate plan was approved by Cabinet earlier this week and board members will be interested to know, following our discussion at the last board meeting, that the provision of affordable housing for island residents is one of the three key areas in the action plan. I've not heard um, whether any organisations other than the Council were able to support the Isle of Wight We Can Be Active event on the 23rd of September, as previously agreed, but I hope some of you were able to do so. Um, uh, we heard this week that Maggie Oldham, who's on the screen there, she was just a second ago, um, will be leaving her role at the NHS Trust to take up a new national role with the NHS England Improvement Team at the end of November. Um, this will be the last health and wellbeing board that she will be attending. So, in her four and a half years in her role, she has made significant difference to the work and performance of the Trust. Um, I don't like the word the Trust, St Mary's. Um, taking it from requires improvement to good. She also made a substantial contribution to the development and effective system wide working to improve the overall health and well-being of the island's population through this board. Um, and I really, yeah, just like to say thank you for everything that you've done for the island, for the island people, Maggie, but for, and for your staff, particularly up at St Mary's, the changes that you've made. Um, and I'm sure you all join me wishing her well in her role, although actually maybe not Maggie, because then you could have stayed, but, you know, hey-ho. Um, so, uh, yes, it, I, I think a round of applause for Maggie. She deserves that. I know the difference you've made to the staff up there, Maggie, and, and the morale and how things are. So, um, sincere thanks. So, that's the end of my update. We've got the COVID-19 update. Um, normally, Simon presents that, doesn't he? Oh, sorry, Joanna. Joanna, over to you. Are we able to project these slides? I've got them, but no one else has them. Okay. okay, we're just going to set up the projector here so that Joanna can put the slides on um, like Simon normally does. It's all a bit new here. Poor old Marie's trying to do 50,000 jobs at once. So um, bear with us, please. My fault. Yep, I can do that. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so, thinking about the rates per 100,000, comparing that to last week, um, the weekly rate in week 41 um, has fallen slightly since the rate in week 40. Um, that is, looking across the country, um, it's a mixed picture with, with some areas continuing to rise um, and some areas stabilising. For the Isle of Wight, um, in more detail, the case detection rate in all ages, the latest data for that is 562.2 per 100,000. Um, and that is a slight rise from the previous seven days of 546 per 100,000. The um, detection rate in over 60s, which we're obviously closely monitoring, is now at 196 per 100,000 compared to 174.7 in the previous seven days. So that is also a rise of 12%. The rate of change across all um, across all ages is, is increasing. However, in the all age case rate, the rise is 3% compared to the previous week. Um, and that is lower than the rise the week before that. So while we're still continuing to see a rise, the rise is is slowing so that the um, slope of the curve is much flatter this week than the previous week. Um, positivity on the island um, remains high and has increased um, since last week's report and it's now at 12.9%. Um, we know that um, testing has increased so this is a it feels like this is a, a, a true representation of, of positivity and that means that um, we always refer back to 5% um, meaning if we've got 5% positivity or higher 
that the um, infection is spreading in the community and isn't isn't under control. Um, so we are in a we are in a, a position at the moment where we have um, community transmission. Um, as I said, um, PCR testing has increased um, since the last week. The number of people tested in the previous positive, uh, in the previous seven days um, is just over six thousand. The picture with um, lateral flow testing is slightly different with that um, pretty stable over the past few weeks um, with 1,362 lateral flow tests having been taken in the last period. In terms of um, age groups, who is most affected? Um, the rates are fluctuating, as we said, but the highest rates are still being seen in children, um, teenagers and working age groups. With the highest reported rate in the as of as of the 25th of October was in 10 to 14 year olds, um, with a rolling rate there of um, 2,729 per 100,000. So a very high rate in that small age group. Um, as I said, the 60% rolling rate still remains lower for the Isle of Wight than many of the other age groups, um, which is a, a positive story because we know that those people are the are the people that are more vulnerable. Um, case rates also increasing in the 35 to 44 age band, um, and this is likely to be um, age band of parents of those um, younger children. Uh, vaccination information. Um, the latest data in terms of uptake of first dose um, that, that we have on the national immunisation system is 87.3% for a first dose and 80.8% for a second dose. Um, and in terms of pressure on hospital I, and on hospital, what we're seeing in terms of um, hospitalizations is a stabilization um, after a period of decline. Um, and in terms of numbers admitted and in terms of number of um, hospital beds, the numbers are fairly low, but we know that there are other pressures on our NHS system and in social care, which means that the, um, the system is still fairly vulnerable. But in terms of COVID, it's a fairly stable situation at the moment. And we're not seeing um, the rise in hospital use at the same rate as we're seeing the rise in cases, which um, enables us to interpret from that that the vaccination programme is doing its job um, in that respect. Um, we're still obviously... Um, really pushing for as many people to be vaccinated as possible um, and thinking about um, the booster programme, which is um, rolling out across the UK um, and really promoting that to um, initially those those most vulnerable groups. Um, and in terms of deaths, which is the, the last metric, um, very small numbers of um, deaths from COVID on the island. And that, again, is very stable at the moment. We're not seeing um, much change from week to week. Um, I think in the last week, just in terms of outbreaks, so we are seeing this widespread community transmission and most of what we're seeing is clusters in households. We're not seeing um, num large numbers of outbreaks, although we have seen, um, I think, in the last seven days, three um, clusters reported in care home settings. So it's, we are seeing some of those care home settings, nothing like um, we were seeing in previous waves. We haven't obviously um, had any outbreaks in school settings um, during half term reported to us. Thank you. That's me. Any questions? That's really good. Thank you very much. I hope everyone could hear you because you, you don't you don't project your voice as, as loud as I do. That's because I'm number 11 of 12 children. So I had to. Um, OK, so is, are there any questions for Joanna? I don't know who you are. Well. Yeah. Um, OK, well, firstly, um, I'm Luke Stubbs, I'm Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner. I hope I'm allowed to be here. The office, my office tells me that I definitely am. But I'm not on the list and I don't know. So if I'm an interloper, um, apologies. Um, my question is um, about hospital admissions. Um, is it true, as I know it was true in Portsmouth a month ago, but maybe less so now, that a significant number of the hospital admissions are actually pregnant women or recently pregnant women who were advised not to have the vaccine? The data that I have, it doesn't break it down. So I, I have access to, to information on hospital admissions, but our NHS colleagues may be able to provide more granular. 
Yeah, Maggie, um, I know you're online. Did you hear that question about pregnant women? Is there anyone at the NHS that can answer that, please? Um, Laura, I did hear the question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I did hear the question, and um, I can say that we are not seeing um, uh, that pattern here in our, our trust. Um, we can look at some of the data. Um, Lois Howell, our Director of Governance, is on the call. Um, she can have a look at that just to inform the minutes um, that go along with the meeting. But that's not something, um, Luke, that is a, a worry to us. Um, I touch wood as I say it because I'm sure you all appreciate it's a very volatile situation. Um, but currently that's not been an issue for us. Thanks, Maggie. Laura, if I may, I did have a question as well. Uh, I don't know if it's... Yeah, that's fine, Maggie. Um, and before I... Um, I'm sorry I couldn't comment when you said the nice words about me. My mute button wouldn't come off, but um, I did just, before I say anything, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, and, um, and while I'm sad to be going, um, I am pleased that um, we the, the trust that I represent is in a stronger place now than it was when I joined and I wish you all well um, with the future endeavours um, that we're working so hard to do together. So my question, Johanna, if you don't mind, is um, I just wonder about the correlation with the booster programme and the elderly on the island. We're seeing a number of patients within the trust who have been, who are, who are elderly, who are double vaccinated. It's hard for us actually to correlate from the data that we see who's who's had their booster when they come, uh, when they're admitted. Um, and I just wondered how successful the booster program is in the, uh, particularly in the over 80s. And again, um, it, it's for us very important that we keep getting that message out. I've spoken personally to a couple of patients who've said they haven't had their booster because they didn't realise they thought they'd had all the vaccinations that they needed to have. So I don't think we should be presuming that because we know people need to have their booster that everybody recognises the importance of that. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, thank you. So in terms of the effectiveness of the booster programme, I think it's very early, early days to be able to give a percentage of effectiveness against hospitalisation or death for that for that programme. Um, I haven't seen anything nationally that's been published on that as yet. Um, and so then in terms of communicating um, about the importance of the booster, I think I absolutely agree that that's something that's that's really important and we should be working as a system. Um, I know that there'll be um, nationally, there are comms around the booster programme, which are promoting the booster alongside the flu vaccination as getting ready for winter. Um, and if there's extra work that we can do as partners to, um, what's the word, it, amplify those messages um, for residents, then I, then I think we would be happy to work with NHS partners and partners across the communications kind of landscape to make sure that those messages are going out in the right way. Mm. I wonder if it's worth us doing a leaflet drop because you know again when I'm talking to some of the people who use my services here at the Trust, um, I'm, I'm, some people don't watch TV, some people you know particularly elderly um, the people that I'm speaking to, so some of the national messages I don't think uh, necessarily get through to all of our population I do know that a lot of people, when we've done uh, mail drops in the past, John, have uh, commented that they found the material very helpful. So maybe that's something that me, John, we can take offline work with Kirk and other comms colleagues on. Um, oh, there's somebody got their hand up first, and then I'll bring in Alison. Um, was it Laurie? Laurie. Oh gosh, there's lots of questions coming in now. So, Laurie, would you like to, or, or, or whatever it was, is it Laurie? Lois. Lois, sorry, Lois. Lois. Would you like to come in? Excuse me, Chairman. I was just checking our daily COVID inpatient data, and there's nothing in there today. They say that there's a disproportionate number of pregnant women amongst our patients, so I don't believe it's a significant issue. And that's our data from this morning. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you. I hope that... That to, um, um, informs you, Luke. Uh, I'll bring in um, Councillor Ian Stevens and then um, Alison. Thank you, Chairman. I noted that um, uh, the percentages of uh, the first uh, inoculation or jab and then the second one, there was a uh, differential between that. About, 
and they're seven seven percent. What are we doing to actually move that forward from eighty percent, which was eighty point something, up to nine, up into the nineties, to the ninety fives, and what have you? We're just sat here, um, presumably, waiting for people to apply for their jabs. What are we doing proactively to move it forward so that we're not sat on 80 percent, we're sat on 90 to 95 percent? Um, quite rightly, we should be looking at uh, another jab for the uh, for the older generation. I've got mine in another week or so's time, a bit of a hold up there because I did it nationally. Um, but to be quite candid, unless we start to drive into the people that are reluctant, or feel that they don't need one until we actually start to put the, put the message out there. I'm afraid that we're not going to we're not going to knock away the the more severe cases or the acute cases that will come forward. I'll leave it at that. But I think that my problem is that, okay, we're sat here and we're accepting the, the stats, but what are we going to do to uh, drive the, drive the stats up in the, in the in, with, with inoculations, etc. Not the not not any COVID nineteen. We want to suppress that. We want to get get to the other side. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Who are we going to do it with? So the there there are there's a partnership group working really hard to ensure that all the invites are going out to the relevant people um, and trying to get some insight in understanding some of the barriers for these for this small percentage of people who haven't yet taken up that offer and um, to, to really try and dig into the array of different reasons for some people that there's hesitancy for some people they have seen a lot of um, media that suggests all, all manner of things about the vaccination program that aren't necessarily true um, other people are just a bit hesitant there may be other people that have um, lots of stuff going on in their life and they haven't prioritised the vaccination um, over, over other things that are going on. And so for us to be able to get the right approach for those different groups, it's quite important that we figure out you know, what are the barriers for, for people and put the right um, messages and the right support in to make getting the vaccination as easy as possible. And that, that work is happening and we are chipping away at these percentages. So the numbers I gave you um, when I spoke are slightly higher than those of which are actually in the slide set that were sent round. So the slide set was from the 25th. Um, this is the, the most up-to-date data that I've taken off the system today. So they are they are going up, but they're not going up hugely quickly. We are getting to the point now, as you say, where we've got a, a group of people who, for a, a, a number of reasons, haven't taken that initiative in the first instance to, to run and get their vaccination. And there's lots of there's lots of re reasons why that is, and I think we're working um, really well with the, with our NHS partners who are who are running and organising that program um, to to be get those boosters out. And we also need to remember now that within the denominator of that fraction, we've got quite a lot of these of younger people. So we've started you know started with the 16 and 17 year olds, and now down into the 12 to 15 year old program. And so all of those people from 12 years and older are now eligible, but the the school age program is still very much in its in its rolling out period. So there are still people who are eligible in that program, um, although the Isle of Wight is actually doing really well in, in that age group who haven't yet kind of had that offer. Um, and although the broad um, approach was to and still is to vaccinate those children in school, um, there are in development and just about to start rolling out um, other channels of enabling those young people to get those vaccinations um, that may be more suitable for various different groups. So that's some of the work going on. And I don't know if, Alison, you want to chip in with anything else. I was going to say, um, Alison and I have had correspondence about this. It's putting out a clear message. Everyone's confused. It's putting out a very clear message about how to pick up the vaccines. Um, and I was pleased with my, um, you know, with the, with the response I got this week with, with one of my residents. Alison, can you fill us in, please? Yeah, could I pick up several points? I just wanted to go back to the maternity. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll try and speak louder. Um, the maternity numbers aren't particularly high. However, the impact on those individual women is quite significant. So therefore, we are promoting quite strongly uh, that all women who are pregnant should come forward for a vaccine just because of the impact of getting COVID on those women. 
And so I just wanted to make that point while we're talking about um, maternity. My second point is the booster vaccination programme is still ongoing. And therefore, as Joanne has described, the numbers go up regularly. It's hard to keep track of them sometimes. And so we're constantly looking backwards and forwards. And this is just a moment in time. And we shouldn't lose that fact that we've still got a rolling programme of vaccination, both for our young people and for our older people. And in relation to the communication about the third vaccine, um, the centre, as in NHS England, is about to write out to all residents who fit into that over 50 year old category. And so therefore, my suggestion would be we wait and see what the uptake is like after that before we do a leaflet drop, because we may want to support that afterwards and do a leaflet drop. But I absolutely agree the messaging is not clear. And I just wanted to make the point that 75 percent of the vaccine programme is delivered by primary care. They are inviting people for their vaccination. There is no rush. Everybody will have an opportunity to be vaccinated. But clearly, we've got to do this in a staged way. Um, and our primary care groups are currently contacting people, inviting them to their appointments. They have visited all the care homes and set those arrangements up in place and will continue to do so. So it is a rolling programme. And there is a bit of um, messaging that we need to get right for our community. But please be patient. Please wait to be contacted. Everybody will be offered a vaccine. And that's the way we will continue to tackle those who haven't had a second one. And we offer support for those who have previously declined and or haven't taken up the vaccine just because of the pressures that they're under for a variety of reasons, as Joanne has described. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, can I bring Councillor Debbie Andre? Because she's been waiting a long time. Then Councillor Ian Stevens and Jill. Thank you, Chair. I've just got two quick questions, really. And again, sorry, it's, it's obviously a theme that's going through this. It's to do with messaging. I've just been able to book my booster. It's not the same vaccine that I had the first time round. And I'm going to have it anyway, but I don't feel that I'm given enough reassurance that having a different vaccine from, I'm not given enough information that having the second, you know, a different vaccine is okay. And the other thing is, initially, when boosters were mentioned, it was taught that there would be some correlation between the annual flu jab. And I'm not aware of that. I've had my flu jab separately, but I'm not aware of any sort of joined up messaging. Thank you. And um, if I pick up the correlation with the flu jab and then ask Michelle, to, if you, that's OK, Michelle, to pick up the question about the um, different vaccines. You're absolutely right. In an ideal world and in a planned way, we would love to offer everybody their flu and their COVID vaccine, a vaccine at the same time. But there is a supply issue here of having both available at any given time. And what we don't want to do is to restrict people having their flu vaccine because that's just as important as your COVID vaccine. Now, you know, I do anticipate in the future they will absolutely be aligned. But at this current time, the supplies don't give us the ability to be able to do that. And so it's important that everybody gets vaccinated for flu and for COVID. And we apologise that might mean two visits, but it's just as important to get both done. OK, can I can I bring in Councillor Ian Stevens and then Councillor Jill Kennett and then I've got Lois and um, and Michelle Legg. Thank you. I'm going to move just slightly away from uh, the, the inoculation uh, element to the testing element. Because uh, I had two jabs. <coughs> and then lo and behold, I was struck down with uh, COVID-19 and uh, and in isolation up to, what, three days ago. Now, as far as I'm concerned, um, I continued up until, up until the point that I, uh, that I got self-diagnosed as, you know, uh, contracting uh, COVID, I, uh, I continue to do self-testing. Now, a lot of people, no doubt, that get their second jab and what have you, suddenly feel that they're free to do whatever they wish, when they wish, and how they wish. 
go to the pub, go to the club, go wherever they want to go, travel without a mask, etc., etc. And I feel that we're not doing enough, and there hasn't been enough done, to actually say, hold on, you can still carry uh, COVID-19, and you can still transmit that. And that's the element, really, that is, if you're going to go um, out and do a leaflet and uh, do some, uh, you know, uh, support uh, element, then really we should be also saying those 80 odd um, percent of people that got the second, got their second jab, make sure, for goodness sake, that you continue with your testing. And it's, it might not be for the individual that's being jabbed, but, if, but it's for the people that they come, in, come into contact with, especially their elderly relatives their, um, and their elderly friends, etc. And I just want to put that to you that when, whilst we're looking at marketing and, and putting out new, uh, new ways forward, that we make sure that we don't forget this, continue, continue to test and do it on a regular basis. And, that, and that's not just once a week, by the way. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say. Right, okay, can I bring in um, Jill Kennett next, please? Um, just a really quick question. Um, will there be the same facility for home vaccination with the booster for our elderly frail? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I think it was uh, Lois and then it was Michelle. Forgive me, Chair, I didn't have my hand up. I do apologise if it appears there. I didn't have anything to say. OK, legacy hand, we saw. Um, uh, Dr Michelle Legg. Thank you, Thank you Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. Um, i just make uh, a few comments. Um, one about um, co-vaccination with flu and COVID. Um, just to support uh, what Alison said, um, we didn't. We we get we got the flu vaccine delivered um, actually before the government even had decided to do a booster program, and um, it was um, much safer to start vaccinating people against flu than to wait and try to do it all together. In circumstances where we can vaccinate with both flu and COVID, we do. Um, but actually, um, the best is try to get as many people vaccinated as early as possible. So which is why some people may have had their flu first and then COVID and um, why we can't always do it together. Um, the second comment about communication, um, a lot of the communication that the NHS has to deliver presently is government guided. And we have to uh, adhere to what the government is, is advising us to say. I completely agree with the councillor's comments about once you're vaccinated, that doesn't necessarily mean you're completely safe. What the vaccination does is reduce against serious illness and it does reduce against being um, able to pass it on, but not completely, which is why we're seeing a lot of activity with COVID but not actually, thankfully, as many people admitted to hospital seriously ill as we did with the second surges. But a point I would like to make about that is that the massive activity we're seeing at the moment is actually directly being managed by primary care and other community services. So that we're extremely busy with maybe 25, 30% of our contacts every day with COVID related issues and also with long COVID. So although thankfully we're not seeing people in ITU, we are still seeing a lot of activity out in the community. Um, I, um, I'm hoping I've answered um, the points that um, I was being asked to raise. Um, just one more point and then I'll um, hand back to the chair. The vaccination booster program and third vaccination. The third vaccination is for people that are immunosuppressed and they do not have to wait the five to six months that actually a other person would need to wait. However, we are still being mandated to vaccinate the groups according to that from the advice from the JCVI. So actually we have to start with certain groups. This is why it may appear that other people are waiting. So I just thought I'd um, add that in. Thank you very much, Chair. 
thank you, Dr. Legg. That's uh, very good information. Um, I'm going to bring in the Chief Exec, and then I know Luke wants to come back. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think I did want to respond to Councillor Stevens' comments, actually, because I think they're really important. Um, the, the national messaging around this is really confused, and I think yeah. national behaviours around this are really confused, starting from government and working its way through. And, you know, I make no apologies about saying that. I think what we've seen across the country is there are one or two areas that uh, are already talking about how they can almost move to the government's plan B um, without the government saying let's move to plan B because they're concerned about the rates in their areas. Uh, and we have our own local outbreak engagement board next week. Uh, I think you know we should be concerned about the rates in our area at the moment. We are very high in terms of the number of cases and we should be having a serious conversation about that at the local outbreak engagement board. I know Joanna has clearly articulated the reasons for that, the high numbers in children you know, affecting parents. But actually, the same things that we talked about when we were talking about save lives, protect the NHS, do all those sorts of things, those behaviours are still re as relevant now as they were then. They just had more resonance then because of the, the then impact on NHS. But now the resonance should be the impact on people's daily lives. We've experienced it in the council over the last couple of weeks where we've had to postpone meetings because people have been, have been infected. So I think something about really trying to build that message again within our community. We don't have the levers to introduce COVID passports to come into camp, all of those other sort of things. But I think building those messages back in our community about face coverings, good hand hygiene, social distancing, we can't do enough to reinforce those messages. And certainly I know that's what we'll be debating next week at the local outbreak engagement board. But thank you for raising it, Councillor Stevens. Luke? Um, yeah, um, we've, we've spoken quite a bit about um, about the logistics of vaccinations and I accept the issue about delivering the two together but I did just want to make the point about you know I think pharmacies should be doing some of this work and they could be after all they do uh, quite a few um, flu injections and you look around the world so Israel was perhaps the ahead of, of everybody at least for a while I don't know where it all stands now in terms of vaccinations and they're now talking about a fourth injection the point is that unlike um, unlike a lot of other vaccinations, you know, the ones we've all had, I'm sure, as a child and had it once and that was the end of it, um, this is different. It doesn't last very long and we cannot, um, I think, as a country, accept the position where a quarter of the capacity of primary care goes into coping with um, with COVID and injections from COVID and so on. I mean, when you actually look at it, I strongly suspect that the number of people who lose their lives through the NHS and primary care services not having been available last year for many people uh, will end up being larger, at least in terms of the number of years of life lost um, than those who died from COVID. And so we need to make sure the health system is functioning. And I do think that, um, and I say this partly from, you know, I'm obviously I'm speaking partly from Portsmouth perspective, I had adult, adult social care functionaire at one time. Um, and, but, you know, there did seem to be capacity there for them to take on some of this work. Um, and I don't know this is any way a local decision, but I do think it's something that is important and should be looked at. Um, right, I'll, I'll let you come back in and then we're moving on, Alison. Thank you. Just on the pharmacy element, when the original booster vaccination programme was instigated, all pharmacists were invited to come forward and um, make an offer to deliver. The logistics around the uh, transporting the vaccine and storing the vaccine made that quite difficult. I think as new vaccines come become available, that will become more um, interesting for pharmacy colleagues and will certainly feed up through the regional group that we've had that we ought to make that invite again and clearly pharmacists are delivering the flu vaccine program so you're absolutely right it would be great if we could align those two and we'll take that back through the regional vaccination program thank you right i'm going to move on to item number six now thank you everyone for your input it's a very i mean very pertinent very important issues um but like the chief said, said so we we have got that meeting next week so we will discuss further uh, so item number six on the agenda is the health and well-being strategy development presentations i understand this is both alison and jana yeah or whoever thank you um thanks very much so um as you can see we've got the health and well-being strategy 
which really is to um, provide two functions, a framework for which we review the strategy, but also to make sure there's alignment with, um, with the other strategies that we have in place, either through the health and care plan, including health and wellbeing, uh, the JSNAs, and also the other pieces of work that we do within the programme. Um, the key areas that we've focused on are, as you described, Laura, earlier, there are three elements. It's tackling health inequalities, whether that's social deprivation, poverty, and also educational deprivation, and making sure that those programmes align. Um, the third element is around um, housing and how we tackle that. And I've forgotten the third, Joanna, so can you step in? Because I'm not reading the slides, I'm talking to them rather than mental health. health sorry, yes, mental health and well-being, which, as you know, we've seen a huge impact since the, the pandemic and the consequences of lockdown uh, and isolation. And that continued, those three continue to be the main focus. Um, Joanna, can I pass over to you? Because clearly you've got the detail, but in a nutshell, that's the context with which we're working with him. Is that better? Sorry. So, yes, I'm just, you may have seen some of these figures before. Um, so, just to put into context the health inequalities, um, if you just click through, please. You, I think it's, it's clear, um, and all of you know, where the main areas are of focus around this. This is just um, updated data that shows us, and as we've heard earlier in today's meeting, um, the three most deprived areas, according to the index of multiple deprivation, are those that you can see above Pan A, Pan B, and Ride North East. So this just gives us a focus for um, where we should be um, focusing our resource and our, and our thinking um, as we move forward with, with this area of the strategy. Next, please. This is looking at a specific as aspect of poverty, fuel poverty. And you can see there um, that as a whole, the island has around 11.5% of all households in fuel poverty. And looking at where those are situated, the um, places with the highest levels of fuel poverty, you can see here in the dark blue. Um, I'm not going to read all of those out. Ventnor East, um, Ventnor West, God's Hill and Roxall are, are some, of, uh, some of those areas. So just thinking about different types of inequality, as well as that multiple index of deprivation, which is what we, you know, is, is commonly what a lot of people think of as poverty um, and deprivation. Moving on to the next one. Um, this is showing how um, deprivation impacts children. Um, and you can see that there is a slightly different pattern um, to this type of inequality um, compared to the last two um, maps which we've shown. Um, so I think what we're trying to say here is that although we know that there are areas where a lot of these things coalesce, um, there are other areas and different types of um, inequalities between different groups that we also need to be thinking about within the strategy. Um, and it's not necessarily that we have to always think about deprivation at a geographical level. Sometimes what we're thinking about is differences between groups of people where, that, where those people are dispersed uh, across the island and how we can act on that in terms of um, think always having inequalities as something we're thinking about in policy making and interventions. Um, next, please. Um, so unemployment, um, thinking about this in terms of um, the, obviously the impact of COVID has um, widened inequalities um, around employment. And you can see on the graph there the difference as we've gone from February 2020, just as the pandemic was kind of taking off um, until where we are now. Um, and that situation's worsened on the island. It's it's worsened across the UK, but you can see here how that's um, affected the island in a, in particular ways and within the communities. Um, next one. So what what's currently um, being done about this? Um, you can I'm not going to read the whole slide out, but you can see here that there are a, a, a range of different activities to um, think about those different types of inequalities that are that, that are, have been um, noted in the graphs and in, in the map, sorry. Um, thinking about the um, impact on children and families, um, thinking about the impact of inequalities on um, particular health conditions. So some of the work that we're doing with our um, NHS colleagues around cardiovascular disease prevention, um, in particular knowing that that is one of the um, 
one of the type of health conditions which most impacts different people differently. So it's, it's a real driver of inequalities when it comes to health. Um, and um, thinking about how we're working around fuel poverty, you know, there's a really active group on the island um, that supports people um, to make changes to their housing. Um, and there are, there are obviously lots more things that can be done, but this is just a flavour of the work that's, all of the good work that's actually taking place just now that does align to this um, high level priority within this within the strategy. And the rest of the slides are set up in a, in a similar way to talk through some of the other work that's being done um, for some of the, for the two other areas of mental health and health and housing. So if we just move on. So in terms of um, mental health and well-being, um, the mental health and well-being index has been prepared for the island. Um, and this just tells you how we've done that, looking at range, uh, data from a range of different sources to kind of assess well-being vulnerability um, and, and map that again across different communities on the islands. And the vulnerable groups included in this index fall into four categories, which are shown here. Um, demographic differences. Um, people with, more, with two or more long-term health conditions are more likely to be more impacted by mental health um, issues. Economic differences, as we've said, and um, kind of living situation, the, 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 socio, the social um, structures within which people live, um, whether that's loneliness or people, maybe young parents um, living with children and how that can impact on people's mental health. If you move to the next slide. Um, and so that index, the kind of collection of those um, different types of um, factors that affect people's mental health is mapped here. And we can see um, that this has told us that on the island, urban populations are much more likely than rural populations to have um, mental well-being, which is vulnerable as a result of COVID. So it's more likely that the impact is for, it doesn't mean that if you live in a rural area, it's not going to happen because it's, it's a relative measure. It's just showing us that within urban areas, some of those collection of some of those factors are more likely to occur together. Um, and you can see there on the map where that may be panning out. Um, darker shading that you can see showing a higher likelihood um, of this index in Newport, Ride, Cowes, so the main towns, um, also Sandown and Shanklin, and paler um, shading in the, in the more rural areas. Um, with those who are most likely to live in Newport Central and Parkhurst West um, being, being some of the most vulnerable, according to this index. Um, if you move on. I think this is just um, talking about um, what nationally, what national data is telling us about how this impact of COVID is something um, on mental health is something which is far reaching and is not a quick fix. It's likely to be something that's with us for a long time. Um, and it, there's a, um, a data release from the Office of National Statistics um, which showed that as many as one in five adults have experienced some form of depression um, and that's and how that's changed that's almost doubled since before the pandemic so we know that this is something that's that is a real serious impact of COVID and is affecting a lot of people um, and you can see that younger adults and women were more likely to experience some form of depression um, than compared to the general population um, well sorry when compared to men of the same age so we often think about um, mental health being something that affects all everybody, which absolutely does. But the data here is telling us that um, women and younger adults have been more impacted since the pandemic. So all of this is important for us when we're thinking about where to place our resource. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just some data from the Office of National Statistics from the Household Survey. Um, which shows the increasing levels of high anxiety um, compared to the national average. Um, and also when we looked at another indicator, which is about service use um, around um, mental health conditions, this is actual admissions for mental health. And you can see again that the island had high, has higher than average um, for that particular indicator. Next, please. Um, so local work programmes around mental health um, we know that we had a really successful um, workshop only recently um, around mental health and suicide, um, which really and it really showed the, um, the 
appetite and, and the commitment of a, a whole range of partners on the island to really work together on this, some of these important issues. Um, you can see here listed some of the work that's going on through the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Partnership um, and focus, forward focus on the um, Mental Health Concordat, so really solidifying what that means for different partners. Um, the Mental Health Alliance, um, that partnership focused on um, the areas of work around building community resilience, um, training and upskilling um, residents and our, our workforce in mental first aid. Um, so that we've got a strong and resilient um, population that can support each other um, and uh, the um, just raising that profile um, with the coordinated communications on the it's okay not to be okay campaign and then also a, a, a parallel focus um, on mental health service improvement so work with the population and then work on the services that that population um, need um, and also um, some work particularly with the older population through age friendly to support people that have been um, impacted by um, shielding um, and also thinking about how important it is um, to not think about physical and mental health completely separately that they're really intertwined and so understanding the um, the impact of physical activity as a tool to help people with health manage their health and well-being um, means that we're bringing some of this work not necessarily together, but making sure that they are aligned in, in the objectives that they're trying to achieve. So thinking about that five ways to well-being that we often talk about physical activity, being active, being outdoors, um, got a brilliant, brilliant environment on the island to, to be outdoors and enjoy the outdoors and be active. And I think that's something that can really um, help um, people with some mental health issues. Uh, next, please. And lastly, um, the third kind of pillar of the strategy is around housing and health. We know it's really important for people to have safe, um, healthy places to live. Um, so I guess that there's there's two two elements to this. There's the homelessness element and actually um, ensuring that people have somewhere to live that is safe and then thinking about how that home environment is, is somewhere where people can be safe and healthy. Um, so if you um, move on one please. Um, this one seems a bit small <laughs> in the text so I'm sorry about that but just um, some local work programs that are going on um, in in this area are, are listed up there um, and you can see thinking about building the right homes, raising awareness um, of people's, for people so that they are able to access support and um, that they may be eligible for um, and thinking about um, how we might work together as a as a system with partners bringing in primary care um, thinking about the damp and uh, damp homes and the impact of living in that type of environment on particularly on respiratory conditions that's really important um, particularly for children who may be living in those conditions just to, for, and for parents to understand that there may be that connection there um, and for GPS to, uh, to have that insight and the time to have a, you know conversations with people to understand their their home situation. And we're also um, linking this into um, smoking cessation. We know that secondhand smoke is really um, an important factor um, for children's health in particular and thinking about how we can support families when we're thinking about smoking cessation um, in general for people who um, still remain smokers, particularly um, perhaps pregnant women working with partners around really supporting that work programme so that children and families who are living together perhaps in um, fairly crowded situations where it's really difficult to if you are if you are a smoker to go and do that away from the rest of your family um, and really supporting those people to to be ready to give up smoking um, and to get the support they need to, to do that I think that's pretty much it um, so these are some of the um, key actions going on around housing um, the MOU um, to we're starting to develop a health begins at home MOU that really um, is that commitment across the organisations to work jointly and um, to use resources effectively together um, on these three headline um, objectives that you can see up here, which is again, as I said at the beginning, preventing homelessness, ensuring people can stay safe in their homes and then setting out some processes to to be able to monitor and continually improve the work in in this area. Next, please. 
Um, and I think, um, as we said earlier in the meeting, it's really important that this health and wellbeing strategy is owned by the board um, and that there are clear lines of sight to other strategies in our, in our kind of um, strategic landscape across the island. Um, and these are some of the key links that are very obviously linked to this strategy. And there will be others. There'll be transport plans and all sorts of things. But the health and care plan, the developing plans of the ICS um, and how they're panning out for um, the place of the Isle of Wight within that ICS, our public health strategy, um, regeneration strategies, which are um, really being developed at the moment as well and refreshed on the island. All of those have really clear links to these three areas. Um, so it's it's about something that's really overarching, not trying to duplicate, but providing that strategic direction um, for us all to work together on. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. I would say actually a lot of that replicates the corporate plan and certainly where I'm coming from with um, mental well-being, physical well-being and financial well-being coming out of um, COVID. So um, certainly it links to those. Is there anyone that's got any questions on those or would like clarification? OK, I'm going to bring in um, Kathy Marriott first, then Councillor Ian Stevens, then Luke. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a number of areas within um, children's services where we're kind of contributing to this agenda. Um, so specifically family hubs, which are kind of an evolution of Shore Start centres. Um, the island has um, really strong family hubs and actually we are leading some work nationally and regionally um, around the development of family hubs. Um, there was an announcement in the budget regarding the Start for Life programme um, and I think we're really well placed in terms of um, moving forward with that programme and being able to promote that and that's very much about getting in early with children and families but also providing that support more to 19. Um, I think we have seen in children's services a significant increase over the last 18 months in terms of children and young people's emotional health and well-being needs and everybody is aware of that. I think the need to ensure that we have investment in building resilience in our children and young people is, needs to be an absolute key factor in this strategy, because actually what we're doing there is investing early. So we're not going to see acute problems, both through a mental health wise, but also through physical health. Um, there is evidence now that um, adverse childhood events and our ability to be resilient to those actually has an impact on our physical health. So it is about investing early in that. And then finally, I think the link to regeneration is really important. I think at the heart of this is deprivation. And I think um, actually the need for us to be able to support our families and citizens across the island in terms of good work um, about, you know, making sure we've got access to education, employment and training is absolutely essential. And I think, you know, we can deliver our smoking cessation, we can deliver our breastfeeding support. But essentially, at the end of the day, it's about deprivation. And actually, if we move forward economically, um, then I think, you know, we'll be able to tackle those issues as well. So I don't want, to, it's really great all the programmes that we're delivering around those other areas. But at the heart of this is about how we invest in our communities. Thank you, Councillor Ian Stevens, and then Luke. Well, I don't want to sound the pessimist every time I open my mouth here. Um, memorandum of understanding, and um, we've got a list of partners. Um, very, very good idea to have a memorandum of understanding from about five or six different stakeholders groups. But I'd like to have seen something about the objectives, something about the targets. I've just heard from Kathy here how great it's going to be to uh, tackle certain elements of, uh, that are pressured. Um, but I don't want it to be another, I mean, and uh, Councillor Brody says, that, you know, we come in here, we sit down, we listen, and it's like a talking shop. I want to see some action points. I want to see where we're going. I want to see where we're driving. I want to see what we're driving what we're driving at, where the positives are, where we're actually shifting things. And to me, 
where, where we are, the same old uh, walk through treacle, re regeneration, you know, it doesn't give me as much confidence as it does, shall we say, Cathy and, and, and others around here. I really think that we need to beef it up with a few objectives of, and a few um, actions, because without that, we're going to come in here next time, you know, have a chit chat about it, and we're going to walk out those double doors again, and we're doing okay. Yeah, we're not doing okay for a memorandum of understanding, because I know that children's services are doing their damnedest. I know the CCG are. I understand that the trust is up at St Mary's, and and I understand that education and, and and what have you doing the same sort of thing, adult social care as well. But until we actually pull these things together, until we actually nail some things to the mast of where we're going, what we're going to damn well try and achieve, once again, we're sat in this nice little talking shop. I'll leave it at that chair, but you know, I do sound I do, I do sound pretty um, despondent at times, but we're we're adding to the we're adding to this uh, forum rather than actually saying, okay, let's let's break open the walls and let's get going and doing it down the road. Thank you. You are being our Victor Meldrew, you know, you really are. But oh, well but that. well said, well said. Um can I bring in Luke and then Councillor uh, Carl Love? Yeah, I, mean, I think this must be the only place in the country with a coterminous um, ambulance system. And one of the things which has come up um, relating to mental health uh, within um, the policing world is that there have been a couple of incidents that I've heard recently, not on the Isle of Wight, on the mainland, um, whereby, well, I don't want to say I'm attributing blame, I've only got sketch information, but I mean, it, it opens up questions anyway about whether an ambulance was dispatched with sufficient promptness in an urgent situation to do with mental health. Um, and I do wonder, just as a point to throw out there, if we need some sort of, I don't know what it is, an agreement, particularly here, where you could dispatch potentially something else other than an ambulance, but some sort of agreement where in the most serious mental health cases, um, somebody is sent out. Take that on board. Uh, Councillor Love. Thank you. I'm sure it'll come on in a minute. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, Councillor Stevens has kind of beaten me to some of the points in a slightly different way. Um, you know, I, I think we do a lot of talking about strategies and there are lots of bits of paper floating around. But for me, um, uh, what makes the real difference is, is, is when the community feels better in itself and that they start expressing that to us generally. So, I mean, I'd like to see much more emphasis in, in terms of uh, within health and, and, and adult social care and the, and the whole spectrum of health and well-being, really focusing upon the outcome. What is the outcome that we want? And actually putting in place as the actions, because we talk a lot about um, policy um, and uh, say bits of paper, but it really is about the actions and what's more, the public need to feel and see those actions physically in order to feel better so that they can see that things are changing and moving forward. So I'm pretty much um, about trying to make sure that the actions are there. And, and the key questions that I ask about all of these policies and all of the changes and COVID and everything is what will things look like in one year and feel like? What will they look like in three years and five years as a result of this pot of money moving from A to B? And I think that we need to put a lot more, I really would like to see a lot more emphasis on outcomes. So we can talk about the problem, and I'm 
This, this comes from me, from me who can talk forever. Okay, so I know my own weaknesses. So the problem is this. This is the problem. Okay, this is the action and the outcome. So that we, because we spend far too long describing the problems, and I know this is one of my big problems. It's far too long describing the problem, but we really need to look at, you know, these are the actions, and then hopefully it'll then be a cascade of an even bigger list of what we've achieved. Um, and I really think that we need to start focusing in um, um, as much as we possibly can. So, you know, these meetings tend to talk, talk about reports, and documents and policies um, that I really would in the future be really asking people to spend as much time as they can saying this is what we've put in now these are the outcomes and this is what we need to change to go forward specifically in the communities that's kind of how I would like to see it. Okay thank you very much so um, I think Alison and Johanna that's, that's a very um, what's, what would I say um, Oh, well, sorry, somebody wanted Leslie. to speak online. Sorry, can I just bring Leslie in before I before I finish up? Leslie, so sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to respond to, to Luke's comment about um, mental health services, uh, ambulance and police working together and just um, give you assurance that we work really closely as a system on the Isle of Wight. And in particular, our uh, relationship with the uh, local police is really strong. We um, do um, uh, Go, go out um, both with ambulance and with police um, to um, divert people into our mental health crisis services rather than into uh, ED. Um, and we're working on um, plans to strengthen that further. Um, so I, I don't I don't think that is an issue for us on the island at the moment um, because of the, the way that we work together. Thank you, Leslie. So I'll let you come in, Chief Exec, quickly. Thank you, Chairman, very quickly. Um, I find myself breaking out in agreements with Councillor Stevens today, which I hope is a good thing. But um, I did, <laughs> I did want to say though that um, just remind ourselves this is an interim position statement in terms of where we are with the development of the um, health and wellbeing strategy. And I think all the points that both you've made, Councillor Love's made, and also Councillor Brody have made are, are very pertinent and will need to be picked up in the final strategy. But hopefully, there was a good flavour of some of the actions that had been taken against some of those key areas. But I think you're actually right. What we need to articulate is what we want to see as a result of those actions over the longer term. And I think that's the next bit of work we've got to do before we bring this back. But thank you again. And I just want to make that particular point. OK, so girls, you've got your work cut out. Uh, good luck with that. And we'll look forward to that coming back. So we move on to item number seven on the agenda, which is um, the Island, recovery, uh, Island COVID-19 recovery plan. That's you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. And um, the Director of Regeneration sends his apologies for today. He would have normally brought this paper. Um, I, I, the, but given where we are time-wise, I think I'll take the papers read, although it was sent around very earlier on in the week. Um, where we've got to now in terms of the COVID recovery approach is we still have a uh, multi-agency COVID recovery cell that's meeting regularly, that's looking at all of the issues that need to be addressed across the island. It's working across the three pillars that I mentioned in the paper of community recovery, economic recovery, and place recovery. Um, all the sorts of things that we've not just seen actually in the health and, and, and wellbeing strategy conversation. Um, but we are predominantly focused on, on seven areas, which um, the Health and Wellbeing Board has said it will keep some oversight on as it's been particularly relevant to COVID recovery. And again, uh, it relevant to the health and wellbeing strategy. So the first issue about housing needs supply uh, and a particular action that's been taken there about uh, whether we could um, secure some further um, uh, modular construct construction units quite quickly to help ease some of the immediate pressure in the system. Uh, in terms of uh, anti-poverty and community recovery, as we've just been talking about, um, there is a specific piece of work that's been done up to capture the, the, the energy and the ability and all of the skills of the community hubs that were set up during COVID and and try and you know, build them into sort of give them some longevity and sustainability and I think that's that's work that's progressing. Um, in terms of education recovery we reference in the paper that um, you know, return to school attendance has been very good. Uh, it has been spoiled by the high number of cases of, of uh, COVID in schools uh, and of course the point we didn't make where we had that conversation was if somebody um, acquires COVID then you can't give them a vaccination for 
it's four months, isn't it? So it's so so in in effect, that's going to impact on our vaccination figures as well. Mental well-being. We've just talked about um, uh, mental well-being to some degree, and we've got the mental well-being update uh, coming further on the agenda. Um, commemoration and celebration. Well, thanks to um, uh, Community Action Isle of Wight, uh, there was a, a commemoration and celebration day for volunteers that was organised as part of uh, Visit Isle of Wight Day. Um, really important to think that we've done some some helpful work around unemployment response uh, to put courses on specifically for hospitality and for social care to try and address the issue of sort of lack of chefs and, and uh, certainly lack of social care workers and we continue to try and do that working very proactively with the college and I think that's a positive response to those areas where we know we've had difficulties in terms of recruitment and filling vacancies uh, and I, I guess Norman might want to make a comment on that when I'm finished um, and then finally um, some work that's that we started off before the pandemic but which is ongoing about how do we how do we brand the island again and, and help to market the island and try and uh, really you know, really go back to rebuilding the economy as Cathy was saying you know, rebuild the economy allows us to you know, create the homes that people need and create the jobs that people need and therefore sell ourselves off island and whilst that's all part of business as usual as well we're still keeping an eye on it as part of COVID recovery so we're looking at it from a number of lenses but I, I think chairman it's a it's an update paper and uh, happy to take questions but uh, I'd say Norman's here, so you may want to make a comment on behalf of the Economic Development Board. Uh, Norman, would you like to come in first, then I'll bring in Councillor Stevens. Thank you. Um, the only comment I would make, just to reinforce, and just to please a couple of the councillors present at least, um, if you want to see some results from things. Um, what we have managed to do as an Economic Development Board is actually coordinate the efforts from the Federation of Small Businesses, the Chamber of Commerce, Visit Isle of Wight, the various hotel groups on the island um, and then the training providers on the island principally the college but other providers as well and we are generating places we're helping to fund some of that um, we're also working closely with the DWP to actually get people funneled and focused and, and helping get people into areas it is hospitality but obviously it's also social care on the island where well I'm preaching to the choir really but you you're all more than aware um, the difficulties we're getting actually finding people within social care settings. Um, so that is actually being worked on. We are genuinely getting some results there and it is nice to actually have something we can look at and go, yeah, we're actually achieving something. So I absolutely take Councillor Stevens' point earlier. Thank you. Councillor Stevens. We've been there before, Norman, haven't we? Trying to, trying to bring forward um, training in areas that are needed. Federation for Small Business has always been very active indeed as of the Chamber. Um, you mentioned the college. I'd also like to mention the schools because prior to, be, prior to students going off to college and making their choice, there's the opportunity to speak within the um, higher education uh, elements of our academies and uh, uh, schools. I think that you know we need to we need to address that. Um, there was a time when we were doing something like that, going back a number of years. I'd like to see it brought back in. I'd like to see us as an as an Isle of Wight council, and indeed as a, as involved with our education um, uh, portfolio and social care, working alongside. Uh, the FSB and uh, the Chamber and what have you, as, as we have done in the past. I don't know if it's going on at the moment. If it is going on at the moment, then um, can we move it up a gear? That's what I'm going to say. Once again, Victor Melview signing off. Thank you. OK, uh, can I bring in Councillor Debbie Andre? Thank you, Chair. Firstly, in response to Councillor Stevens, we do have um, various bodies at the moment um, including the Island Careers Partnership. But I'm not sure, Norman, what um, engagement that they've had with you so far, because they are, they've, they've relatively uh, newly reformed. So Councillor Stevens makes a good point. So I will, I will follow that up, because I think liaising with the um, FSB and, and businesses um, is, is a, a very positive move forward. So thank you for that. 
There we go. That's one good thing out of today's meeting. Um, collaboration working. Just what I like to see. Uh, um, are there any other before we move on? OK, so I'm going to move on now to um, item number eight on the agenda, which is the um, mental health update. Um, can, um, as you are, will be aware, mental health, which is what I've just said, mental, physical and, and um, financial well-being coming out of the pandemic is, is the three priorities um, that I'm really championing. Uh, and with that, we've actually put in, have to change glasses, um, Councillor Michael Lilly has agreed to be our mental health champion um, and he's done a quick report that it says um, that he started to make connections with all agency and stakeholders to get an overview um, of how mental health services and the need looks like on the Isle of Wight. He's working closely with um, Health Watch, uh, Joanna Smith, Public Health and Mental Health Alliance in planning Health Watches and Mental Health Champion, Isle of Wight Mental Health Listening Tour, which has now been launched and started. Um, three places and groups have now been visited and they're already accumulating some very useful and enlightening information. COVID is a real factor the residents now have to live with, which really affects their mental well-being. One action um, he's doing is working with public health um, on bringing all existing mental health champions from schools to community groups or in private, voluntary and public sectors together in the Isle of Wight Mental Health Champion Forum. Um, this is something that I absolutely insisted Michael tried to do because I think there's a lot of repetition and I think we can be much stronger if we all work together and we're all brought into a room. So I'm really pleased he's doing that. Um, he hopes to report back um, with Joanna from um, Health Watch uh, in more detail at the next Health and Wellbeing Board. So without further ado, Leslie, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to just update you on three things. The first is um, the recent CQC inspection. The second is our uh, mental health transformation programme. And the third is um, the partnership working that we're doing on and off island. Um, if I start with um, CQC, as you, you know, um, CQC inspected um, the trust uh, recently and in mental health and learning disabilities, they came to four of our services, two of which had been rated inadequate in the last inspection inspection at uh, the um, community mental health team and the wards for older people and the other two had been rated requires improvement and that's our crisis services uh, and adult mental health wards. I'm really delighted to say that all four were rated good um, by CQC this time and I think it's particularly impressive to see um, services go from a rating of inadequate directly to good. Um, uh, in um, in particular, um, uh, that CQC highlighted uh, improvements in practice that they'd seen uh, with regards to our relationship with people who use our services. Uh, and in fact, uh, last week, um, our lived experience team leader and the team leader from our older people's mental health ward were invited to present the brilliant work that they're doing to a regional CQC meeting um, because the CQC had been so impressed by what they'd seen when they were here. Um, we have at uh, this time three must do actions um, that have come out of the report. Um, last time we had 50. Um, so I think that's a good measure of um, the improvement that's been made. Um, the three are um, improvements uh, needed to our psychological therapies waiting list. And we, we do have long waits at the moment for psychological therapies um, and uh, doing a lot of work at the moment to increase our capacity in recruiting recruitment of psychologists and psychological therapists is not easy anywhere and I think probably particularly on the island but we um, we are uh, making some progress with with that um, but also making sure that we're properly engaging with and offering alternatives to people who are waiting. Um, the second must do action was with regards to our health based place of safety, which is in based in seven acres and they had concerns about um, the access and the space in that unit. Um, and uh, we're working with our estates colleagues um, at the moment and work on that should start uh, early in the new year um, to address all of the concerns that um, CQC raised. Um, and the third issue was regards to um, updating 
risk assessments in our acute ward. Um, and again, an intensive piece of work has happened not just on that ward, but across the service, because we're really keen to make sure that um, any learning that comes out of this um, inspection is, is shared across um, and, and good work happening there to address it. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of our staff in mental health and learning disability services. Um, they've achieved all of this improvement through a pandemic. And I think it's just uh, fantastic. It's just a, a brilliant achievement for them. Um, I think um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is our transformation programme. And really, that has been uh, the key driver um, for uh, all of the improvement that um, CQC saw. Uh, it's underpinned by our strategy, uh, which is called No Wrong Door. And the No Wrong Door strategy is all about opening up access um, to mental health services so that people can access um, help earlier um, and, um, and we're really tackling the kind of stigma and discrimination that can get in the way of people coming forward to seek help for mental health problems. We're also um, really focusing on improving our responsiveness to people who are in mental health crisis or people with complex needs and high risk. Um, and the third really important element of this is a really fundamental change in the relationship that we have with people who use our services so that we're not doing to, we're doing with, we're really working shoulder to shoulder with the people who use our services. Um, and I think the uh, CQC inspection um, evidenced uh, progress with all of those aims. Um, the transformation programme impacts every bit of our services, um, but we, we kind of um, pick uh, key priorities that we focus more resource on and that is a kind of rolling programme that, that goes on and at the moment I'll just tell you about three there are, there are many more than that but the um, three that we're really focused on at the moment are um, our buildings um, and I've just mentioned the place of safety work that needs to happen uh, but there's a, a number of other issues around our, our community estate um, for mental health is uh, not where it needs to be um, you may be aware that we were able to purchase a building on the high street in Newport um, earlier in the year and really good plans are being developed now um, to um, refurbish that and to make it a really vibrant hub in the centre of, uh, of our community um, that again will really impact on our ability to open up access to services. Um, so some exciting developments there. I think it's going to take a while to get there. That's, it's not a, a small job by any means. So I think we're looking a few years down the line, but that um, the planning is happening here and now. And we're absolutely engaging people who use services and our staff in uh, creating those plans. Um, the second really um, uh, important development is um, around IT. Um, and uh, this morning while I'm here, some of my team have been uh, presenting a business case around um, our new IT programme to one of our subcommittees in the board. And, um, uh, and that is about replacing our um, uh, electronic health record. And the health record that we have at the moment is slow and clunky. It doesn't connect properly with other parts of the service. Um, and it will be really truly transformational across all that we do uh, when we can move into a system that really works for us um, and meets the needs of our um, service users. Um, and the third one I'd, I'd um, emphasise is around our medical transformation. We've got a really tiny um, psychiatry workforce on the island. We only have 11 posts and at the moment only half of those are filled. Uh, we, um, we fill the gaps with agency doctors um, but the burden on those doctors who are substantive is significant and I think you know all credit to them for carrying you know a huge amount of work and responsibility across the services um, and it's really expensive to run a service on agency doctors so the opportunity for us to do something different is really um, there and we're working uh, really hard with our doctors at the moment to look at how we deliver things differently so that we're making sure that services are safe that medical uh, staff are able to be responsive where they're needed um, but that we um, shift the model so that we're not as um, dependent on the agency doctors that we've had before and as a first step in that um, from Monday we're creating a um, what we call a middle grade a staff grade uh, rotor that will um, uh, 
improve our responsiveness during the day and at the weekends to people in mental health crisis. At the moment, one of the real challenges we have is that if someone presents in crisis um, and they need to see a doctor, they often have to wait because all of our doctors are busy all of the time. Um, and this new rotor is, is um, we're hoping will give us a solution to that that will enable us to be much more responsive whilst allowing our consultants to get on with um, the work that they need to do. Um, Finally, I wanted to say something about partnerships um, from two perspectives. So first of all, our partnership with Solent uh, NHS Trust has been a really crucial part of um, all of the improvements I've been talking about. Um, and at the beginning of that partnership, they were incredibly generous in their support of us and we really needed their help across a whole range of things. Um, but this partnership, I think, has been so successful that we're now in a position to change our footing with them. We've got something to offer back to Solent. And so what we're doing at the moment is looking at where are the opportunities for mutual benefit. And in particular, we see those opportunities as being uh, looking at where our services are subscale, both in Solent and on the island. Um, and therefore, there's opportunities for us to work together and give each other some more resilience, um, but also looking at quality improvements and sharing learning across and that's two ways uh, you know there are some things like our our approach to lived experience um, and our co-production uh, that we do um, brilliantly now on the island and I think we're, we're supporting Solent with developing their services in that way and there are many things that Solent do really well that we're learning from too not least their um, acute mental health pathways which is one of the best in the country. Um, our on-island partnerships are just as important and on a day to day basis more important because they're absolutely part of everything that we do. We deliver uh, integrated services across the whole of mental health and learning disabilities. Um, our um, learning disability team is a really good example of that. We're working to fully integrate our adult social care and our um, uh, NHS learning disability community services. Uh, and one of the things, the building issues that we're trying to work on at the moment is finding a place where they can co-locate because I think that will um, further help the good work that they're already doing and working together. Um, but all of our services now have uh, some element of partnership with adult social care and that relationship in particular has just been fantastic, has made a real difference. Um, but also with the third sector, for, ex for example, um, is Aropia delivering the wellbeing service and Two Saints uh, delivering the safe haven. Um, and there have been huge steps forward in our working with primary care with a big expansion of primary care mental health workers and looking at how that um, interacts with our path way. Um, the other thing that's been really important to us in the last year has been um, the very close working with public health and there's been lots of conversation this morning about the mental health impacts of the pandemic um, and we're working um, through the Mental Health Alliance um, to um, make sure that you know, we're prioritising the mental health uh, recovery. Um, and we've in particular across the system been looking at three cohorts. We've been looking at the broader public health, mental health impacts for everybody, having been through what we've all been through in the last couple of years, but also looking specifically at the um, pandemic impacts on people with serious mental health problems um, and also on our staff. I think we can't underestimate just how um, impactful the last couple of years have been on health and care staff um, and, uh, and that's a key priority for us all to work together on uh, and making sure our, our staff are, uh, have the resilience to keep going in what continues to be really challenging circumstances. Um, oh, that was all from me, thank you. That's absolutely fantastic and that mental health um seminar thing that was online was absolutely brilliant leslie the only thing was there was so much information your head was my head was a shed because there was just so much to take on board but i really really enjoyed for the you know the, the the hours that i could stay there i definitely think it's worth doing that again but maybe in shorter much shorter maybe one or two hour slots because um, it would be very useful if the slides are already there. OK, are there any questions around the mental health update? No? OK, well, it, it proves you're doing a superb job, Leslie. Thank you so much, because, you know, without our good mental health, the rest doesn't follow, does it? So it's it's extremely important. So thank you very, very much. Um, if we move on to item number nine now, which is the Better Care Fund. I have to say I read this paper, girls, rather you two than me, seriously. Um, so good luck. I'll let you carry on. 
Um, I guess I'll make a start and the helpful position is that the last time this committee met, you had the quarter four report of the previous Better Care Fund um, process. So I'm hoping that it is something that you are all at least sorry, something you are all at least a little familiar with. Um, the Better Care Fund is a mandated scheme. The local authority and the clinical commissioning group are required to have a Better Care Fund Section 75 agreement and um, central government dictate what must be included within that agreement. There is the option for us to use our discretion to add additional uh, services, additional schemes and additional support. And across the Isle of Wight since 2017, we've chosen to do that to the benefit of local residents, where it makes sense for us to jointly commission, and it is a commissioning vehicle rather than anything else, um, services in a way that put the person at the centre, but enable us to share resource. That's what we've taken the opportunity to do. Every year, central government release uh, guidance, which tells us what our scheme must look like in the financial year. We're very fortunate and that guidance was released at the end of September for this financial year. So we received it at the end of quarter two, which is always helpful when we're looking to plan how we can best utilise our joint resources. Equally of great benefit to us is the fact that they've sent us a timeline for submission, which sees that this year's Better Care Fund must be submitted by the 16th of November. So having waited six months for the guidance, we as a system get six weeks to decide how we're going to implement it and what we're going to do. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, a complete review of our Better Care Fund arrangements in this financial year isn't possible within the timescales that have been set and imposed upon each of us. What we've chosen to do is to undertake a, a review of our current activity, to maintain the majority of the work within the Better Care Fund as we've known it for the last uh, 45 years with very few adjustments and to really focus on next year and what that scheme needs to look like next year. I suspect come 23-24 when we're talking about uh, this will be in a very similar situation and I don't see next year as being any different. It's unlikely we'll receive the guidance within the next few weeks for next year which would enable us to do a proper job of reviewing it but we will work within the timescales we've got. In essence, the paper sets out for you the 12 areas that currently fall within the Better Care Fund, the funding allocations attached to them, and where that funding originates from. It shows you that the CCG are complying with their mandated requirements in terms of their input to the Better Care Fund, that the local authority are complying with their mandated inputs into the Better Care Fund, and that collectively we've managed to pull resource to maximise the island pound in delivering social care and health services for local citizens. It identifies the three key areas we want to focus on moving forward, and those three key areas are critical because we've seen some changes in the way in which we do business, but also the way in which the Isle of Wight needs us to respond. Those key areas of change uh, are around the early help review that's being undertaken at the moment and that is really focusing on what we need to be doing differently to support our communities following on from the, the pandemic and the reactions and responses we saw within that phase. The second area for review that we're looking at is our regaining independent services and hospital discharge. We know that that part of our scheme developed at pace and in a really responsive way uh, as a result of the pandemic. What we want to do is make sure that the schemes, that the funding and that the governance around those schemes absolutely aligns with what we need it to align with moving forward. The third area for review is around um, a longer term proposals for the Better Care Fund. And that's really the slower time work that we'll do to prepare for next year's Better Care Fund. And that will involve a deep dive into many of the areas, into the funding streams and into the allocations within the Better Care Fund to make sure we're getting it right and to make sure that we're delivering what we need to deliver. It comes before the Health and Wellbeing Board as you are charged with approving the Isle of Wight's Better Care Fund um, every year. You've seen it every year for the last uh, four or five years, and we're asking for your approval of the BCF draft plan that's been provided. We're also asking for you to approve the review and refresh of the BCF schemes, both during this year and in advance of the 2023 submission, so that we make sure that we're taking forward the key developments across our system. 
The only other thing I want to say, which isn't included in the report, is that the people engaged in delivering the Better Care Fund are the same people engaged in delivering many of our other strategies. Um, we work together around the health and care plan. We work together around the evolution of the integrated care system and our local offer that will pin off of that. And we work together um, with colleagues in public health around health and wellbeing strategies and delivery of the council's corporate plan. So we are also ensuring that there is alignment with those key priorities where they're becoming um, available to us and as they're emerging. I don't know whether Alison wants to add anything to that summary, but I hope it provides you with a bit of context around what is quite a technical and lengthy paper. I agree, technical paper, but well done. Um, Alison. Uh, just a word that whilst um, Laura quite rightly puts out the timescales we have to work to, actually our intention and our strategic direction is to continue the joint working and to match the demands that we're seeing in our community. And that whilst the guidance comes out, we can pretty much predict that we're on the right track. So whilst uh, I, I, I get the irony and the timescales that we work in too, you know, we're used to working to tight timescales, but the strategic direction that we're moving ourselves in, aligning with the strategies, looking at the community needs, we're absolutely joined up in our approach to that in an integrated way and making sure we align with the strategies that are being developed uh, have been developed, but also as they go forward. So I just wanted to give that extra bit of assurance um, on, on that. And, and the final thing I wanted to say is whilst we do this together, we uh, quite rightly hold each other to account and take full responsibility for our component parts in this, but with the intention to support the community as, as a group, rather than necessarily as our separate organisations, though we do understand our responsibilities in that. And we do that uh, with humour. And um, and to make sure that we fulfil the requirements that's given to us um, through the guidance. So just wanted to make those few points. But thank you, Laura. You're always so good at doing that. <laughs> you do need a sense of humour. Um, OK, are there any questions on this before we agree and note it? No? OK. Uh, Councillor Stevens, you've got a question. In actual fact, um, looking at it, I, I, I was after the timeline element to which hasn't been agreed as yet i assume item number 58 it's got the timeline on there ian i think on number 58 yeah i was looking at the risk of that factor in the paper uh point two agree timeline for full review in 2021 to 22 in preparation for 22 to 23 that's what i was looking at is that element is that been, been, been that's, yeah, yeah, relating to the section 75 changes, I think that refers to. So that's the technical element that has to be done as we guide this. That the section 75 um, document has to um, has to align with what we agree through the BCF just to make sure that we've got the paperwork correct and the funding lines correct. So it's not about the review, it's about section 75. Does that help? It helps, but it also says that, it, you know, you've got to agree and it's in, in amber there. I won't bother to go up and down the risk uh, element, but it was just that I wanted to be assured that we did have a timeline agreed. It just doesn't seem to be agreed within that sector, that's all. I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to die in the, I'm not going to die in a ditch over this. But I think that, you know, when, when things are written down in the paper, it's right to query it. I think it, Councillor, if I just just help, that's the the risk is is that we fail to submit the thing on time. The mitigation is we agree the timeline, and the the timeline has been agreed. So it's just ha highlighting how we're going to manage that particular risk. Okay. So is everyone in? Um, uh, to, to, oh, sorry, Councillor Andre. Sorry, just quickly, I was going to say there is a planning timeline on page thirteen. If that's helpful. Okay. I'm leaving it in the capable of capable, very capable hands of Laura and Alison. So um, do we have approval of that draft, please, which is to note the proposals and approve. Is everyone in favour of that? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we move on now to um, item 10 on the agenda, which is the health and care bill. That's you, John. 
Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Not a huge amount to say on the health and care bill at the moment. We've placed it on the agenda because we weren't quite sure where that was going to develop through Parliament. Uh, I reported on it verbally last time. Um, the intention uh, still, and is it's still going through Parliament, that uh, integrated care systems will be established uh, from the 1st of April 2022. Um, the NHS is currently off, is currently uh, interviewing for chief executives of 42 or 43 integrated care systems across the country. I can't remember exactly the number. Um, and of course, we will be part of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight integrated care system. So at that particular point, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight CCG will cease to exist, but the Hampshire and Isle of Wight ICS will take over its responsibilities. But it's a little bit wider than that. It would also be delegated uh, all the funding uh, for health services that are currently held and managed regionally will be delegated locally. Um, so I think there's still an awful lot that's developing in this particular area that we'll need to keep you updated on as it develops. But I think for now, there's not a huge amount more to say today. Thank you. No questions? No? OK. Moving on, I see Derek has joined us now because I can see DB on the screen. Um, so uh, luckily those letters are bigger than, than people's names. So um, Derek, it's, it's over to you. It's item number 11, the Isle of Wight Safeguarding Children's Annual Report. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Apologies that I wasn't able to join you for the whole of the meeting. Um, hopefully, uh, colleagues have had the opportunity to read the report and the very useful cover note prepared by Jane Lee, the board manager. Um, as usual, the uh, annual report covers background information. There's um, a wealth of data in there. Um, it focuses on the activities of the partnership, both in year and over a three year uh, uh, span. Um, there's a wealth of information in there. I wasn't proposing to go through it page by page unless anybody wanted to. Happy to take questions. Um, I just wanted to point out, and it's a statement of the obvious, which I'm sure has come up in uh, just about every agenda item. It's been a COVID dominated year. Um, but what I would say, both for the Isle of Wight and the other partnerships where I have the privilege of working, I saw partnership elevated to a new level uh, over these the period of the pandemic, where we've seen colleagues from social care, health, education, the police, the voluntary sector come together, share information, cooperate, maintain that critical line of sight into the vulnerable children in our communities, probably better than we've ever done before. That willingness to be there for the other agencies um, is something we want to keep going once we emerge from the effects of COVID because it was truly inspirational to see the way, as I say, senior colleagues and practitioners on the front line work together. Um, happy to take any questions that anybody may have. Um, I would commend the report to you. It's uh, if you compare it with others that are prepared around the country, I think, albeit 45 pages long, which is a big ask of anybody to read that, it is worth a read and it's full of very, very pertinent information. Happy to take any questions you may have. OK, to prove that I did read all 45 pages, um, I was just going to say I did like um, on page 34 the fact that you quoted what some of the youth were saying. And actually, I think what what, what that particular youth said was very, very pertinent. Um, I, what, I'll just quickly go through a couple of them because I thought it was it was very there was, I mean, there really was. The stats were absolutely fantastic. I'd like to thank the fire department that um, that brought something to your attention um, that was needed. And I think that was good because you wouldn't necessarily think that the fire would think. On page 44, I'm very useful to have those stats and those numbers, um, Derek, because, you know, we always wonder. We have a huge amount of money being spent on, um, you know, staff and accommodation and everything. And you always wonder how many people it's actually hitting. So to have those numbers on page 44, I thought was very, very useful. Um, 
the looked after children again um you the um on page 47 that was extremely i mean i'm sure uh, councillor andre was probably at the meeting when um the children said that they didn't want to be called looked after children they wanted to be island children um and they didn't want foster carers to be replaced with foster parents and i just think do you know what that's such an you know that is just it's just it's a silly thing but gosh that's just so important um uh, on page 48 about the health the isle of Wight nh trust that they've set up a um a children and young people's forum now i think this is really good because they could be the the nursing staff of the future so um i'm really looking forward to keeping a good track on that because i think that's useful um i won't go on but i did i did read it and i really enjoyed um, oh, the only other thing was, sorry, page 57, um, there was a thing here about the uh, NHS Trust, Bernardo's and the Hampton Trust. Um, they, were, they were successful in a bid for funding for mental health support. I don't know whether you've heard of Space for You, No Limits, um, and the Youth Trust on the Isle of Wight, um, but that Space for You, I've never been so impressed uh, Councillor Ian Stevens and myself went up and met with them. I've never been so impressed with women that really are at the absolute coalface of, of ringing up and speaking to the children that we've got on the island. Um, so I, I would have liked, um, maybe Derek, I don't know whether there's something, I'll, I'll send you on some of their details so that you can try and bring them in and hopefully i do hope that they get they get money um the same with the youth trust too um in in uh, newport so i i won't go on because i'm sure other people have got stuff to say but yes i did read it and i really enjoyed it thank you very much uh kathy uh, just to provide some assurance um the youth trust were heavily involved in the funding bid that went for the mental health work in schools and so they're a key part of that delivery as well they were one of the partner agencies so it's fantastic that they're on board with that as well good to know as i say, i was really impressed with the other one i've not been to youth trust but the but for space for you was absolutely brilliant they really were right are there any other questions around that uh councillor andre thank you not so much a question but it, i i also read through the whole report the full version and I think it very clearly states our, our, our mantra has always been that children's safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. And I think that is so clearly evidenced in this document. I'd also like to um, highlight that this, this, there is so much in here that, uh, that evidences learning from reviews, improvements. So it's not just, it's very much not just a talking shop. It's a very um, comprehensive um, body that, that really does evidence how we are keeping children safe on the Isle of Wight. And I really thank you to you and your team, Derek, because this, this, is, this is fantastic work. And I'm very, very proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I think we all agree with that, Derek, superbly. So um, are we OK that we, we note that report? Yep, everyone in? OK. So we move on to item 12 on the agenda before we freeze to death. Um, uh, but just remember, we lose more weight when we're cold. Um, so item number 12 is members' question times. Are there any questions from members of the board? For anyone here? Victor. Okay. No? So uh, that's 11.20 something. I call this to us. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I need hot drink.